Today, I'm in Gloucestershire, home of Double Gloucester Cheese, the Gloucester Old Spot Pig, and one of the strangest customs in the United Kingdom, because this is where, once a year, they chase an eight-pound wheel of cheese down a very, very steep hill, often breaking several arms and legs in the process. Of course, the authorities keep trying to ban it, but it hasn't stopped them so far. Anyway, it's really good driving country as well, so I'm going to stop witching on and get going. Gloucestershire is in the southwest of England, bordering Wales to the west. Its 1,200 square miles of peaceful and tranquil countryside are home to only half a million people. It is also home to three contrasting areas of beauty. Most of the wide and wonderful River Severn winds through the middle of the county. The entirety of the leafy and lovely Forest of Dean resides within the Gloucestershire borders and the majority of the Cotswolds sit spectacularly on the eastern edge. Home to pretty villages and swathes of farmland, the Cotswolds has been named an area of outstanding natural beauty and attracts 38 million visitors a year from every corner of the world. So, in a nutshell, we're talking about a seriously gorgeous place that has some very interesting and eccentric people. First stop, Westbury-on-Sea. The River Severn is the longest river in Britain. It winds 220 miles from its source up in Wales over there, down through Gloucestershire and into the Bristol Channel. Now, the tide in the estuary can rise by as much as 50 feet, and that can cause a huge surge of water to rush up the river as a standing wave called the Seven Boar. You've probably seen it on the telly with people trying to surf it. One man claims to have ridden it for seven miles. But it's not surfing that's the main tradition here in Westbury-on-Sea, it's fishing for eels. And I'm off to meet a bloke who likes to fish the old-fashioned way. The eel and its baby, the elva, have been a mainstay of local life for fishermen on the Severn for hundreds of years. The elvers swim all the way from the Sargasso Sea in the Atlantic to find a home in the river. Traditionally, locals caught the elvers and sold them on, and the ones that escaped the net would make their way into the streams that feed the River Severn. These streams acted as nurseries, so the elvers could grow safely into eels away from predators. But in the last few years, fishermen have noticed a decline in the elver and eel numbers. Climate change, poaching, and tidal river defences that stop the elvers getting to the streams have all been put forward as reasons for this decline. But whatever the cause, local fishermen are trying to save this traditional food and, more importantly, their livelihood. Richard Cook, whose family have fished for elvers for generations, is pioneering the scheme. So, Richard, what's the situation now? The elvers yeah. have... They're under pressure, yeah? Yeah. The recruitment or the catches have dropped. Yeah. Um, so... And that's for many reasons, you know. The, the fish that enter the river find it very difficult to get out now because we've built flood defences. Right. Every ditch, every drain, every tributary has got a, a gate on it, yeah? They can't access the nurseries, yeah? Yeah. So it's, you know, it's... And that is, you know, that's an important part of their life cycles. They come to live in our waters for a period of time, you know, for 10 or 15 years yeah. before they go back to spawn, so... Bizarrely, they're, they're a d delicacy, aren't they? They are now, yeah. Yeah, yeah Al Alvarez of... of, of their perception is as of a delicacy, but yeah. now you go back not so many years, maybe just 30 or 40 years, yeah? This was poor man's food. Yeah. This was, a, this was an important source of protein for locals along the, along the banks of the Severn and the Y and the Parrot. And but you, you've got a scheme, haven't you? You're part of this sustainable yeah. group. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, you know, it's, and it's, it's, it's a really, really good operation and good scheme to, to help with the recovery plan for the eel, yeah? So you're catching the, the, the elvers low down, yeah. like, nearer the mouth, and then you're putting them in further up the river. Yeah. This gets the elvers past the floodgates and into the streams where they can grow into eels away from predators. Richard and other fishermen still make a living catching these little fish, but as part of the scheme, they put 40% of their catch back. So you're involved, yeah? You're involved today. Yeah. This is a bit of a, like a ritual for, for us and my family, yeah? Every year, at the end of every season, we put some feed in. We've made these fish, we've had these fish now feed in for a few weeks. Yeah. 
and we restock these back to the wild. There's a bit of a thank you, yeah? yeah. Like a pagan thank you, you yeah, know, to, good, for the it? season, you know? Yeah. And, it, you know, it's, it's the feel-good factor about, you know, we've taken the fish from the river, and now, today, you're going to put 10 or 12,000 fish back in. Right. So, you know, it, this is a long-term thing, yeah. you know? But, I mean, I'm not sure whether I will see the success, but what I know is my boys will see the success, yeah? yeah? And I want them to have, you know, I've had a very privileged life. Yeah. Fishing the Alvers and so my father, yeah? Yeah. And I want them to share the same, the same privileges I've had, you know? Well, should we go and put some of these back in the river? Absolutely, yeah. Marvellous. Yeah. Richard, his two sons and his dad, with me in tow, are going to release the Alvers into their nursery, a small stream leading into the River Severn, to hopefully begin the resurrection of the fish's numbers and safeguard a local delicacy. So... This doesn't look like the Mighty Seven. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to disappoint you. No, you're, no, it's true. This is a, but this is a really important tributary of the Seven. This is the nursery, yeah. Right. So all these floodplains have these kind of ditches, the ditches, ditches, ditches and which are, yeah, which are the start of it, really. Yeah. So this is where the, these little fish will live for the next, well, as long as they don't get out. Well, we'll try, try and put some in. Yeah. <clears throat> that one's trying to get out. Look. I know. They're keen, aren't they? <laughs> yeah. Here we go. Say, what? Well, I want to get back in the white box. Yeah. <laughs> I like it in the white box. What was wrong with the white box? We were happy there. We had food. We had company. <laughs> we were they in the wild. <laughs> no roof. <laughs> it's so wet. <laughs> oh, dear. How many was that? It was probably around about just under a thousand fish. Was it? Doesn't that feel good? Yeah. Hey? It was great. <laughs> yeah. How many of those do you think will survive? They say that. Um, that somewhere between one-third and two-thirds of the fish will make it back for the wild. All right. Now they've actually got them into the nurseries yeah. and they're feeding. Mm -hmm. I hope we've given them the best chance to, you know, to survive yeah. now. But let's not forget this is all about preserving a traditional food and one that I'm eager to taste. I'm cooking them up the old-fashioned way, fried up with scrambled eggs. Tastes like meaty... Spaghetti. There, so there is a bite to it. <laughs> <laughs> so how do, how do you square us eating these with, with conserving them at the same time? It's, it's a preservation of a, a culture, you know? That we, we have a strong culture of yeah. fishing and eating glass eels in, in Gloucestershire, yeah? Yeah. And we need to, we need we to, to look keep, after that. Yeah. yeah. Otherwise we just become oh, bland, no. sort of... Yeah. <laughs> we do become a bland nation, don't we? Yeah, if we absolutely. don't keep our kind of... Yeah local traditions. Going. It's important. It's really, really important. Plus the fat. They're tasty. They are, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> they look very happy. I am trying. <laughs> Next, I'm off to sample one of Gloucestershire's most famous tipples, Perry. It's like cider, but made with pears, and there are plenty of pear orchards in this county. It's been drunk by everyone from farmers to fishermen for hundreds of years, and I'm off to meet Kevin Minchu. He's been making it for most of his life. Uh, I've, I've come here to seek out the man who makes the, the perry. Is it, is it, do you know who he is? Speak. Not getting on very well with him. He must be Kevin. I am. How do you do? Kevin, how do you do? I'm fine, nice to meet you. This is a fantastically well. looking, sort of bucolic sort of place, a isn't it? A cottage industry. Yeah. In its truest sense. Yeah. A shed industry, a I shed, call yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Everybody's got to have their shed, haven't they? <laughs> yeah, it looks beautiful in here. So how's Perry made? The rack is put down, the yeah. frame's put on. In goes a net or a cloth or yeah. a hair. Um, first. First of all, and yeah. in goes a, a couple of buckets of fruit pulp, disintegrated pears. Yeah. And then this is folded over in a particular fashion right. with the pulp inside, yeah. tamped down, and then this frame is lifted up to the next station on these holes. Yeah. Various pegs to locate it, and it's built up in a succession of cheeses yeah. or layers, if you like, until we get up here, about 800 pounds of fruit. And then the board goes on top. And you start squeezing it and down. And we with start these. gently squeezing it down. Yeah. Out comes the juice. And yeah. from there into a barrel. And that's it. 
Over a few months, the pear juice ferments into alcohol, aided by the natural yeast found on the fruit skin. And that's Perry. Very simple, and the same as it ever was. What I've tried to do is to produce uh, a product um, that somebody from 100 years or more ago would have recognised, yeah. because it's made the same way, with the same varieties of fruit, yeah. um, and hopefully it's going to turn out to be what was an original product. Yeah. So it's history in a bottle. Yeah, it's an extraordinary yeah. idea, isn't it? Now, let's find out what history tastes like. This little tipple is called Blakeney Red, a still perry. Did you have to do a lot of research to... Uh... Oh, years. <laughs> years and years. Years and years. Drinking it's perry. been a struggle. <laughs> yeah, I can bet. Yeah. You can imagine. Mm. But I think it's worth the, um, oh, that's the investment in time. It? It's, it's quite different, isn't it? Yeah. How old do you think it is as a drink, Perry? I think it, it's as old as cider, so we're looking at uh, a drink that was around 2,000 years or more ago, yeah. possibly more than that. Yeah. It, it's, it's so easy, um, an animal... I mean, the thing about fruits like apples and pears is they ferment so obviously on the ground. That's right, yes, they, yeah, yeah. They start mm -hmm. to... I mean, you see cows that get drunk, don't you, from eating them? We take the pulp off the press down to a local farmer and yeah. his cattle and sheep and pigs yeah, have a eat good it. Old Friday they night really them, enjoy they? it. And, <laughs> They watch a little red van coming through the gate, and every time the postman pulls up, they all surge <laughs> towards a hedge. Well, where's our, where's our swag? You know? Perry's coming. That's right, yeah. <laughs> they love it, yeah. Well, cheers. Good health. What's ale? <laughs> Go away now. We're going to spend the rest yeah. of the day here. <laughs> <laughs> Only joking. I'm driving, more's the pity. Kevin had the kind of um, look in his eye that seemed to suggest he'd done a fair bit of perry sampling in his time. He was telling me, um, just as we were leaving, I was asking him how business was going, and he said, well, you know, whenever I see my accountant, he looks at the figures and says, what, what are you doing? And, uh, and he apparently says, well, I'm looking after our cultural heritage. His accountant says, well, you can't eat that, can you? And you can't. So we should be thankful to him for keeping it going. I'm travelling the length and breadth of Great Britain, meeting people who are keeping our traditions alive. Today, I'm in Gloucestershire. So far, I've helped save the eel from extinction. What was wrong with the white box? We were happy there. We had food. Good company. <laughs> and now I'm heading to a beautiful part of the county to watch something rather, well, bonkers, to be honest. This is fantastic. I love this. It's so weird. It's so quirky. It's so very, very British. It's the delightfully eccentric Olympic Games. That's Olympic spelt O-L-I-M-P-I-C-K. And it's held in the world-renowned centre for sporting excellence that is Chipping Camden and they've been doing it for 400 years. You've got to see this. The Olympic Games were first introduced by a nobleman called Robert Dover in 1612. His idea was to have a local games for local people, just like the original Olympic Games in Greece. Back then, they took part in sheath throwing, the standing jump, tug of war, and the uniquely mad sport of shin kicking. 399 years later, and well, it really hasn't changed much, Stunning natural amphitheatre overlooking the Cotswolds? Check. People competing in silly events? Check. Tug of war? Check. And the insanely English sport of shin kicking? Check. I'm off to meet James Wiseman, a former shin kicker turned stickler. Confused? Let's investigate. So, James. Yep. You're a stickler. That's correct. And I'm not just describing your personality. You're, the stickler means something in this you, competition. Well, yeah, it does, actually. It's, um, I mean, it, be, it really comes from the fact that I hold a stick, but uh, basically it means I'm, I'm, I judge the shin kicking, right. for want of a better term. So it doesn't mean you're a stickler for the rules? No, 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 definitely not. Yeah. No, definitely. Uh, shin kicking, is it an ancient thing? It is, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think it's, it's, certainly, it's certainly got to be at least uh, seven or eight hundred years old. Yeah. Um, That's... It's a, it's a long time. It's a lot, a lot of pain. So, yeah. uh, and, and you've been a competitor yourself, haven't I you? I have. Yeah, I've done. I've, I, I shin kicked for uh, for four years. Did and, you? Uh, Was and it incredibly painful? 
Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, yeah there's no... There's I no... can't, I mean, I mean, you've got fairly stern shoes on there. Is that the kind of shoes people wear? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we we, we draw... would re I mean, that's just going to really hurt, really, really, really badly. Ow. It's, it does, it does smart. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, I mean, we obviously we allow people to put straw in, which which does soften the blow a little bit. But I'm, it's. I'm sorry, straw. What's straw going to do? I mean, it's... Can't, <laughs> straw can't do anything it's... apart from leave an imprint of straw on it, your shin. It it, it it softens the pain a tiny, tiny bit. Yeah. So uh, yeah, it's still very, very painful though. And what are the basic kind of rules then? If you're if, you're, if, you've, if there are rules, I mean, no, there are there, there are rules. Just stand there no, no, each no, other. no, no. It's a it's a it's a noble art. But so if I if I was to start as if I was shin kicking, yeah, I would hold your lapels like that. You'd hold my lapels, yeah. yeah. And then I'd go if I went to kick your leg like yeah. that. Your natural reaction is to move your leg out the way. Yeah. As you move your leg out the way, you're going to try and throw it. I'm going to try throw it in the ground. Yeah. So that's that's and that's, that's the key. Basically it. That's how you score a fall. I have a, a facsimile of the rules here. Oh yeah. And uh, I like this disclaimer at the bottom. It says, uh, shin kicking is inherently a full contact dangerous sport and we're not responsible for any loss or accident to you or third parties, including property damage, injury or death. <laughs> well, it's, uh, we like to cover ourselves. It hasn't yeah. happened yet, but... Uh, you haven't had any deaths We haven't had any deaths, no, no, no. Hopefully few, few we dead legs. We've had a few, we had a few dead legs. We yeah. had a broken ankle last year, but uh, we've had no death yet. We're... And the stickler's decision is final. I know. I know, it's a lot of responsibility. It's nice to be in that power. It is. Well, let's bring it on. OK. <laughs> yeah, right. Thanks very much. No problem. Right, it's shin kicking time. I can't wait. Now, before you ask, I am not taking part. I'm 54 and I like my shins. But it appears my new friend Joey doesn't care much for his. Nervous? Scared? Yeah. Have you done this before? Once, two years ago. But... And... I got out first round. Yeah. 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 Shall I have a quick kick just to see how they're working? Go on then. If it, if it, if it hurts, I know that I did it wrong. <laughs> Thank you, I'm going. Yeah. How about that one though? I'm, I'm a bit itchy, so it's okay. <laughs> Unfortunately, I forgot what to do now. What I know is you'll keep the person shin. That's quite yeah. square, you win. I, I think if you can't remember what to do, just keep you're going to lose really quickly. <laughs> <laughs> Well, better luck for the other guy, yeah? Yeah, yeah. I wish I was fighting you. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> yeah. I'd have joined if I'd known you were going to be doing it. You're on. You're on, mate. As well as filling their socks full of straw, the competitors have to wear white coats. These represent the original shepherd smocks the competitors wore in the first games. It's then best out of three, with the winner progressing to the next round. I put a lot of money on the other guy. I'd advise you to do the same. No punching or spitting or gouging. No gouging. Spoil sport. Collars down. Oh, collars. No, 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 up on the shoulders. Ready? Kick! And they're off. Oh, blimey, it's a bit brutal. Bungee trampoline. No throw in, just kick in. Whoa. Textbook, I thought that throw, you know, as a seasoned campaigner now. Well, it looks like I'm right. Joey isn't cut out for shin kicking. He's one nil down within seconds. Ow, oh, God, that hurt. <laughs> oh. this, is, this is why I didn't do it. This looks horrible. Oh, oh. oh. Joey wins that one, surely. Well. Now for the decider. And he's won! <laughs> I knew he could do it. Damn, I've lost a lot of money. <laughs> you look kind of... Where's the water? You're kind of drunk on pain. Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's, he's really hurting. <laughs> Joey's through to the semis. Poor lad. Hi, hi. You're looking really kind of sweaty. Was that kind of what you were expecting or not? I, I thought, honestly, after the first time you, you went down, I thought, this is this is in the contest. We've chosen the wrong bloke. Yeah, you're in that guy. <laughs> but, but then you kind of okay. picked up. I, I you, gotta go now. You have, yeah. Okay, hug for like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna get out of this guy anyway, because he looks bigger. <laughs> Joe's chances are looking up though, because his opponent seems to have forgotten his boots. Oh, winded in there. Oh, maybe not. 
It's difficult perhaps to, to make an effective uh, contact with the shins wearing socks. Oh, oh, it's gone for a flurry. Oh, and it was the downing of him. And that's it for another year for our young hero. Did you get any serious damage? There's a couple that seem to me landed right on your on the side of it. Yeah, they're pretty well kicked in, aren't they? Oh, that's not nice. I got three cups out today. You got a cup? Yeah, I, I asked for a free beer, but the guy said no. Yeah. <laughs> Time for the world final. Huge man with boots, smaller man with socks. Doesn't take an expert to predict. And in less than a minute, it's all over. And as night draws on, the games are finished for another year. There's just time for fireworks, a big bonfire, and then a ceremonial parade back into Chipping Camden. Well, this is uh, one of the biggest torchlit processions in the world. Um, I think there's about at least 2,000. I know they've sold 2,000 of these. Whether anyone's bought any homemade ones, I don't know. But um, the chances of catching fire are quite great. Hooray! This way to Frankenstein's house! Those shin kickers are feeling like this morning. <laughs> Hobbling out of bed. Oh dear, it did look painful. If I were a younger man, only about 10 years younger, I would have done that. But it was a sad admission of old age that I just couldn't face doing that. I so, thought, oh no, it's going to have me limping for about five or six months. With my little caravan in tow, I've been searching out foods and traditions that make Britain British. And today, I'm in Gloucestershire. So far, I've saved the eel. Doesn't that feel good? Yeah. Hey. Nice. And I've seen a few shins kicked in. Ow! Oh, God, that hurt. And next up on my journey is one of Gloucestershire's most famous animals. It's got four legs and a snout. Can you guess what it is? The Gloucester, the Gloucester Old Spot, the Gloucestershire Old Spot, or simply the Old Spot. Four names, one pig. One of the oldest breeds in Britain. In fact, five names, because it was also known as the Orchard Pig, because they used to let it forage on fallen apples in the orchards. Some say it gave it a ready-made apple sauce flavour. Let's find out. The Old Spot is the oldest spotted pedigree pig in the UK. It was the first to be mentioned when records began in 1885. The Orchard Pig was also said to have developed its spots from bruising due to dropped apples. But of course, there's no concrete evidence of that. The Old Spot is a slow maturing animal that takes almost three times longer than modern breeds to be ready to eat. So over time, its popularity waned in favour of crossbred pigs that were cheaper and quicker to mature. It's now making a comeback due to its high quality meat. And at the forefront of that revival are Judy Hancock's and Gary Wallace of Butts Farm in Sirencester. So Judy, you're looking after Gloucester Old Spots, which are recognised as a kind of disappearing breed, really. I think they were, and they're the best breed in the world. You must understand that. Oh, that's fantastic. Wonderful, bless them. But so, no, I think they're becoming more and more popular. Certainly in this part of the world, Gloucestershire. Yeah. They are absolutely. This. I thought it was about only about of two thousand of them left. Well, yes, but that's quite a lot, really, isn't it? Well, I think that's kind of <laughs> critical. <laughs> no, they're not. They're not critical. They're, they're not. They are. Right. They are coming up. So. And these are um, some baby ones in here. Are these they? are some baby ones. These are about twelve weeks. Why do you think um, breeds like the Gloucester Old Spot and, and the other kind of ancient British breeds sort of disappeared? 
not disappear, but just went into decline. Well, you've got to accept that after the war, we were under so much pressure to produce so much food so yeah. quickly that these finish very slowly. They take six months from birth to plate, basically. Yeah. Um, and as hard as you like to pump them full of concentrate, they won't take it. They won't take. They just like traditional low-protein food, yeah. um, and they will finish in their own time. They're rather like us pigs. They want more than they need. Mm -hmm. They're always hungry like us. I do look um, a bit like a pig. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know how it feels too. Um, so you have to really feed them a lot of fibre um, and not very high protein. Right. And they munch well, away like, at the like straw. I like I try and have my muesli every morning. Uh, that's exactly it. Yeah. They, their muesli is the straw and, and quite high, high fibre um, pig nuts. Judy has old spots of all ages on the farm. Next up is the fully finished pigs. That's a nice way of saying they're off to the butchers soon. Gloucestershire old spots are a huge claim to fame at the moment, um, is that they've got a thing called traditional status guarantee, TSG. Oh, like, it's like French wines, isn't it? Totally, yeah. it's the only breed of farm animal is it? Um, that when you put on the menu, for example, that it's Gloucester Old Spot it Sausage, has to come it from Gloucester. jolly well has to, <laughs> No, not actually come from Gloucester, it can come from anywhere, but it has to be a Gloucester Old Spot pig. Right. Has to be. Now, if you're thinking it only needs a spot to be an authentic old spot, you'd be wrong. It takes much more. The ears have got to flop forward, and the nose has got to come to the end of the ears. Uh -huh. Not any further, and not any less. <laughs> and, uh... I know some humans like that. <laughs> <laughs> As a proud breeder, Judy likes to show her pigs at county shows, and the best on the farm is Curly. I'm about to be shown how to walk a pig. Can't be that hard, surely. <laughs> right, so we're going to get this side of Curly. Side That's of curly. it. And say, walk on, way. Curly. Walk on. This way, Curly. All right, go the way you're going. Uh, no, go this way. <laughs> go this way. <laughs> this way. Walk on, Curly. Come on. Round this corner. No, the other way. <laughs> Away from the food. Yeah. And head in the bucket. Oh, look, it did what I said. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> There's no control mechanism at None all. It's just doing what it likes. And None I'm at all, exactly. It. Just keep smiling and pretend that's what you wanted it to do. Is that what you do in the show? Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yes. Yeah. Oh, this way, this way, this way. <laughs> <laughs> this way, into the cage. Come on, here we go. Yeah. Oh. Ooh, Do you want to go back this. in your pen, Curly? Look Good, Curly, back in your look pen. There you go. You see what an expert. I, I don't think she wanted to do that. <laughs> You see, I'm a natural with pigs. Next up on my piggy tour are the parents. So these are the breeding sows? These are the breeding sows and the boar, Gerald. Ah, he this must have a Gerald. nice life. Oh, not bad. Yeah. Not bad. This is a fair amount of food. Some women. A constant supply of women. Yeah. How old is he? He's only three. Is he? Yes, he's quite young. He's a big boy, isn't he? Yeah, he is a big boy. Yeah. We have to spend our whole time, like all pigs, stopping him from getting too big. Right. He's got really kind of rough skin, I know, he? you can see how they made shaving brushes and paint brushes yeah. over their coat. That's really kind of wiry, Yeah, isn't really it? wiry. But I'm not just here to discuss pig's hair. Judy wants me to help her move a pregnant sow into a shed to give birth. Come, Come on, Tony. Come on. Oh, look, it's pig handling expertise. Come on. Sort of coming out. Come on. Hut, hut, hut. That was scary. Oh, dear, she was frightened of that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Are you going to move? Come along. Is that how you do it? Are you going to move? Going Come to move? along. Come along, darling. Good girl. Come on, darling. Come along, darling. Oh, oh look, oh, you yes. see? You see? Oh, look at that! Biggie, biggie, you got biggie, it. Biggie, 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 biggie. It's working. Biggie, Every biggie, time. Biggie, biggie, biggie. Big, big, biggie. Shall I give her some here? Yeah, she's got Come some on. food in there, but give her some more. That will be lovely. There we go, and there's a lovely place, you see, and then the piglets can get in there away from yeah, her. Yeah, a little so creep so she doesn't roll on them. And she's got a heat lamp in there. For the piglets still need a bit of warmth, even though it's a jolly warm day today. It still gets a bit cold at night. And she'll make a lovely nest out of that straw. Mm. 
A piggy maternity ward. It's a brilliant maternity ward, the best. Yeah. And moments later... Here we go. <laughs> Piglets. Actually, these are ones we prepared earlier. Well, not as. Um, Personally. Some, some pigs. How old are these ones? These are four days old. Are they? Yes. Oh, they're really cute. They are so sweet, aren't they? Can we pick them up? You can. Sometimes they make an awful noise, but let's give it a go. Oh, no, no it's a one. sweet little grunchy note. Ah, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's all right, little piggy. It's all right. Oh, it's really bristly already, they isn't are. it? They are amazing. They look lovely yeah. and soft, but they're not. They're, 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 soft. they're a bit spiky and a bit noisy. Yes, you Ooh, are. You're a bit noisy. Yes, <laughs> yes. That's so funny. And then you put them down and that's it. No noise then. That's all right, that's thank good, you. That's it? what I want. Well, it seems horrible to say it in the face of these little piglets, but now I want to go and see some bacon. Definitely, that's what they're all about. <laughs> and as much as we love them, yeah. they are for pork and bacon. They and pork and tasty. bacon is delicious. Yeah. Exactly. So I'm going to see your husband. Lovely. Let's go and do that. <laughs> so, Gary, I think a lot of people don't understand all these differences between bacon and dry cure. And, and, I, I uh, think you're right. And, and what's the difference between bacon and gammon? Right. Bacon and gammon. Yeah. Gammon, effectively, is a cut. Right. And we'll come on to that in a moment. Right. Um, bacon is the process of curing pork. Right. So that is bacon. Where the problem arises is when people say, I want gammon ham. Yeah. Gammon is uncooked. Right. Ham is cooked. Uh-huh. You can cook shoulder and still call it ham. Ah. See, that's the problem, isn't it? Are you with me? There's too many names. There's, yeah. And, and also, they do change from area to area. Yeah. Now, We've got some legs. That's right. Now, this, these would have, would have started off life as legs of pork. Yeah. Um, and then we cure them. And you end up then with a gammon. OK? So you said three things in the same sentence there. Yeah. It, it was a leg of pork. It was a leg of pork. Then it, then it got cured and became a gammon. Yeah. Yeah. But at no point in that time has it been ham. It's not been ham. Or really what I would call pork, because pork I think of as roast pork. With crackling. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, but yeah. you're saying raw pig is raw in fact pig pork. Raw pig is pork. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, totally. I need some gammon for, uh, right. for okay. what I'm cooking today. I'm well, cooking... On, the, on the block here, what we've got um, is the centre <clears throat> cut of gammon, um, known in the trade as the horseshoe, yeah. for obvious reasons. And we'll Where, cut... Whereabouts is that from on a that pig? Is from the middle of, that is from the middle of the gammon. Right. So, effectively, what we've done is we have taken the best of that gammon from the yeah. middle there, OK? Yeah. Um, and obviously remove the bone, um, which would be the femur bone, if it were mm -hmm. you and I. All right. Um, and then we slice that through and give you your gammon steaks for supper tonight. Brilliant. OK? Yeah. Yeah. And do you like a nice thick gammon? Or you... yeah, yeah, I need it about, I think, yeah, about that thick. Yeah. I mean, you look at that. Look at the colour there. Yeah. I mean, lovely white, what lovely white fat. You know, that'll keep the cholesterol levels up, won't it? Yeah. You know, I need to keep mine bolstered. Do you? Yeah, they're yeah. pretty high anyway, so, yeah, I, just, so I like what, to yeah. keep them up. Keep them up there. there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Support them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and um, I mean, you know, the colour of it, and just feel that. I mean, that is just so smooth. Yeah. You know, there's yeah. no coarseness to that at all. Yeah. Um, well, I wish you well with it. Thank you very much thank indeed. Thank you very much for showing. My pleasure. Me. Cheers. Take care. Thank you. I think I've got a good one there. Oh, cheers, mate. <laughs> <laughs> you can see um, Gloucester Cathedral over there. And the extraordinary thing about Gloucester Cathedral is uh, buried in the churchyard there is the bloke who wrote the music for the Star Spangled Banner. American National Anthem. See those Americans? Never invented anything of their own. Yes, we had to do it all for them. I'm in Gloucestershire on my travels across the UK, searching out traditional foods and pastimes. I've already been to some wonderful places. I've saved a few thousand baby eels. 
I've chased pigs around Butts Farm. <laughs> this way, into cage. And now I'm here at Tewkesbury Abbey to cook a Gloucestershire dish from the back of my caravan for a man willing to whistle and drum for his supper. An ancient musical tradition around here is the pipe and table, which is a kind of medieval equivalent of the one-man band. And a man who's keeping that tradition very much alive is Richard Sermon. That's tremendous. Thank you. Tremendous. Thank you very much. Thank you. Explain to me what it is you're playing exactly. I'm playing the pipe and tabor. Which... There's a very few um, holes to play. I mean, yeah. you can think of a recorder or something like that, and there's, or a penny whistle. There's... You're thinking of a lot of holes, aren't you? That's right. You've only got three holes here. You've got two finger holes on the front and a thumb hole on the back. And the reason for that, obviously, is so you can play it with one hand. So you can yeah. play a percussion instrument, the tabor, with yeah. the other, which is a small drum with a sort of gut snare across yeah. the uh, so head there. That's just twanging and giving that's it right. a... That's right, just snapping and giving it a strong, yeah. strong rhythm. You've got another, in another interesting looking thing on the uh, table back here. That's right. But you've got some interesting friends as well, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> Richard's friends are a local mummers group. Mummers are people who perform raucous medieval plays and sing traditional songs known as wassails. What have we got here? Well, this is a, a tambouran accord or a tambouran de bern. Um, yeah. It's a string drum. I mean, to my ears, I mean, it sounds uniquely medieval. Not that I know what medieval thing sounds like, but it just sounds really ancient. Well, I'm going to cook something for you now, and uh, after that, we, we'll have a bit of a wassail. Brilliant. That's That'd be all right. Great. Okay. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks very much. Right, today I'm making a dish with no name. This dish has its origins in Gloucestershire's medieval past and combines the county's abundant supplies of pork and fruit. But strangely, they never gave it a name. Uh, it's a dish that combines gammon with fruit, which we think of today, you know, quite often. Gammon and pineapple. But <clears throat> medieval cuisine often mixed meat and fruits. No one really knows why. Might have been a preservation thing. First, I fry off the gammon steaks I got from the farm. These need two minutes each side to brown them. I'm using quite a big timer today. That tells me that these are ready to turn. <laughs> two more minutes on the other side, and they're ready to line the pie dish. Next comes the fruit. Right. So, here we have our gammon. Apricots. In medieval times, they often cooked fruit because they believed it carried diseases. Dried fruit. Yes, seems counterintuitive. But I couldn't get enough of this. Now, this is a bit like a Lancashire hot pot, this bit, really. Pick a slice of potato. The potato had an uneasy birth in Britain. When it was first introduced, some people thought it was actually poisonous. But in time, its easy cultivation and nutritional value made it so popular it became the staple diet of both rich and poor. That's looking a bit like a pie. <clears throat> Some stock. I'm going to pour this stock in through the potatoes until I can just see it rise up at the edge. A couple of knobs of butter on the top. Because butter doesn't hurt. Mm. And there we have <coughs> our unnamed medieval pie. Gamma and apricots. I'm going to put it in the oven. <coughs> and, uh, set the timer on the abbey. Uh, one hour. There we are. That's an hour. <laughs> Here we are. It's baked down, rather. <laughs> How 
hand you some irons. Come this way. <laughs> it's very hard to eat this standing up, but um, do attempt to have a taste. We will try. Right, thank you. We'll give it I'll a just go. get myself some. Thank you. You're more than welcome. What do you reckon? Mm, that is pretty good. Thank you. Well, isn't it? Yeah. It's um, Gloucester Old Spot. Mm? Where's uh -huh. the spot? Mm? Where's the spot? Oh, no, it's on the other We haven't put the spot in. <laughs> the spot is, um... It's a bizarre concept, isn't it, meat with fruit? I mean, I don't just mean the modern kind of stuff, but the idea that they used to eat so much of it. I suppose before, sort of, you know, I suppose potato as well, I suppose you'd have had more vegetables and more fruit with your, with your meat. And in the medieval period, of course, you'd have eaten more, well, I suppose, a high table, some more hot courtly society, they'd have more sweet meats and things. Yeah. Mm. If you want to try a taste of medieval Gloucestershire, here's how to prepare it. First up, brown off the gammon in some butter. Then layer the bottom of the pie dish with the steaks. Cover the gammon with apricots and dried fruits. Layer over a healthy helping of thinly sliced potatoes to create a pie lid. Then pour over the stock until it becomes level with the potato lid. Finally, add a few knobs of English butter to the top and bake for one hour at 180 degrees Celsius, gas mark four. You can find details of what you've seen in today's show at itv.com slash food. And there you go, an unnamed medieval pie of gammon and apricots. So you're in the Mummers Society. Mmm. What do mummers do? We've all heard of mummers, but ah, mummers, I'm not quite sure why they exist and why, why, what they do it for. No one quite knows. It, it's very ancient. Some people say it goes back to pagan times, but it's mm. probably medieval courtly entertainment for Christmas. But lots of those traditions, whether it's the Maying or the Morris or the mumming traditions, it was when the, down the social hierarchy started a sort of courtly things, entertainment, and then filtered down the social hierarchy. And then it's, you know, the poorer people going around the big houses at Christmas time, um, sort of, you know, you know, getting sort of drink Christmas fare, you know, a yeah. bit of money. Um, you're going to do some wassailing for me, I believe. There's two different traditions, really. Yeah. You've got sort of the one that most people know about, which is sort of going around apple orchards, yeah. giving the trees cider and toast and reciting a wassail rhyme to encourage them to bear fruit in the coming year. There's another one which is actually again going from house to house with a decorated wassail bowl. Oh. A wassail bowl. Yes. Um, which is basically a very alcoholic punch. Yes, yes. It's mostly it's a, cider, bit of perry. Bit collecting of... booze, whatever will go yeah. in, sort of, yeah. that's right. Like a student party. <laughs> yes, yes. In, one, in one bowl. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm begging the occupants, you know, the big houses for cheese and bread and, yeah. and drink that's and money. A bit more for the bowl. That's right, that's right. Yeah. Yes. Just an excuse for a booze up, really. Yeah. Yes, I think it is. Right, well, right. it's time for you to pay. Go on, hey. start singing. We sail, we sail all over the town. Our bread it is white and our ale it is brown. Our bowl it is made of the green maple tree. In the way sail bowl we'll drink unto thee. Well, that's it from Gloucestershire. They're a bit of a rebellious lot here, you know, chasing cheese down hills, kicking each other in the shins, giving cider to trees. It reminds me, actually, I've got some perry in the caravan. Oh, I'm suddenly very tired. Good night. <clears throat> 